And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I'm returning good brother to the temple, the head of Pickpocket Press, creators of Low Fantasy Gaming, and the soon to be the soon to be creators of Low Life 2090, Cyberpunk, and Sorcery. The one and only Steve Grodd. How are you doing tonight, man? Very well, very well. How are you, Mildred? Thank you so much for having me back. I really appreciate it. And hello to everybody out there. It's always always a pleasure to always a pleasure to have you on, or to or to roast people's bad taste in games. <laughs> <laughs> Look, indeed, I hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are cremated equal. <laughs> Not too soon for me, I hope. <laughs> we just ate. so when it comes now. When it comes to something like lo something like low life, now the last time I had you on, it was to discuss um, low fantasy gaming, which is basically doing a grittier take on um, the sandbox that D and D fifth edition provides. Yep, yep, yep. Now, was low life twenty was the path to creating low life twenty ninety just a uh, ma just a mashup of the sixth the sixth world and the and the D and the D and D sandbox that you had create that you had already messed around with, or was there a different path? Uh I had in mind that after I well, as I was doing um, as we were doing the companion book actually for Low Fantasy Gaming, I was trying to figure out what would be good to do next, mm -hmm. and I knew that I felt like the like most of the low fantasy gaming mechanics and bits and pieces had been covered by the time companion was finished. I felt like that a lot of it had been done. I mean, you can always go into more and, mm -hmm. you know, go into more detail and make more settings and so on. But I felt like that, that had that, you know, I'd spent two or three years on that longer than that, actually, if you go back to low fantasy gaming original and, um, I thought, okay, what can I move to next? And, you know, you know what? <clears throat> when I was young, it, particularly or 20s and 20s and 30s, I did play a fair bit of Shadowrun and Cyberpunk and mm -hmm. some other um, sci-fi style. Not full sci-fi, like in spaceships and things, but near-future cyberpunk-style games. And I thought it would be very awesome to um, make something like that, but using the – or trying to use the um, – low fantasy gaming engine to, you know, a large degree, which is really just, you know, a modified version of Swords and Wizardry and some other things piled on top, including certain mechanics mm -hmm. um, from 5th edition. Um, so, yeah, so I started putting it together that way, and I knew that I had the Midlands, you know, sitting there from low fantasy gaming. So I, it's, it's yeah, it's it's a mashup of, I don't know, it's it's... Yeah, cyberpunk plus, you know, magic and fantasy monsters, fantasy races. You've got elves and dwarves and whatever in there. And I tried to, yes, yeah, smush together, I <laughs> suppose, um, cyberpunk plus, uh, yeah, a, a fantasy world in, in an alternate Earth. I mean, it's, it is supposed to be some variation of Earth as opposed to for example, taking the Midlands low magic sandbox setting and, and advancing that in time to to the year twenty ninety. It's not really it's not really that. Although I've borrowed bits and pieces, some of my favorite bits from Midlands I've stuck into into this yeah, twenty ninety book. Yeah, so it's a bit of a hodgepodge. For better or worse. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> now setting what setting wise, um well what well I know that I know that there's a lot of it, that there's a lot of it where somebody could look at it and say this is de this is um, low fantasy gaming meets um, cyberpunk as opposed to something like Carbon Twenty One Eighty Five, which is straight which is straight up D and D meets um, cyberpunk. Yep, but yep. 
when you were when you were design when you were designing it um can you talk to me about the point where it started to veer a little bit away from the cyberpunk origins or not not yeah. the cyberpunk origins per se but the uh, shadowrun origins yeah i suppose that the what i had had in mind was um a game where setting wise at least magic had always been present and monsters and so on had always been present um fantasy races had always been present in the world so from a pretty early stage i had always anticipated that's that would be the sort of background to it um and but i mean having said that although that was the idea when i was writing it it and i'm still writing it you know to be honest it's still, it's still being written there's no final there's no final product yet it's still just a draft pdf really um i mean the draft is fairly advanced um and we put the draft out a little while ago to the backers but uh yeah the idea was fantasy world mixed with um yeah advanced technology um and in addition to elves and dwarves, you know, we'd stick some other races in there, like the Scorn. Although they're not really the Scorn from Midlands, because the Scorn in the Midlands are prototype humans, not Neanderthal cannibals, <laughs> who are really brutal. And so for, for 2090, we've had to modify them. They're more civilized than that. They're, you know, they're not Neanderthals anymore. They're just a, another kind of humanoid, I guess not too different to an elf or a dwarf but they are different um and then we added in the minotaurs and the spriggans which is sort of like you know a goblin-esque smaller stature you know a bit like a halfling not a halfling but um bigger than that actually but um something sort of similar to a to a halfling or an elf cross with a halfling or something like that but uglier i guess because they're they're sort of goblinoid-ish mm -hmm. origins but yeah, so I probably didn't answer your question. <laughs> your question but, again. <laughs> well, it's it's correct me if I'm wrong on that, but it sounds like you weren't trying to do some case of uh, it's the it's the stand it's the standard world, but now magic is coming back. Instead, it's the case of magic no, always no, no. been here. Magic always yes. been here. It's just the yep. civilization is now advanced. Is, you have a civilization that was a fantasy civilization in the past, and now now with enough time, it's. Um, adapted to a more futuristic approach. That is true, but I mean, it is also set, you know, on an alternate Earth. So, you know, it's not. It's it's a little bit hard to to mix. It's a little bit weird, I guess, to mix them together. Um, but yeah, that that was the idea. Is that they haven't suddenly appeared? They've always been there. There's always been this threat from beyond the veil. These awful abominations and monsters that are lurking there um that might break through at any moment and in fact you know that I, I did a little very short i like to think of it as mercifully short um alternate history although some might prefer a much more detailed history but i did a little sort of two-page alternate history which it you know included basically two magical cataclysms one 25,000 bc which is before before the second cataclysm and then the, the the zero bc cataclysm which is um when the rifts all open and all sorts of awful creatures come through and basically decimate um much of the world and then it sort of moves forward from there um so we have <clears throat> the so yeah we have instead of the cold war we have the void war where it's like the cold war but it, we substitute um magical apocalypse rituals for um nukes <laughs> and in fact there are no nukes in this game so just as a quirk of science or whatever nukes don't exist there's still nuclear power in terms of just regular power but not weaponized versions um, and instead you have these three three major powers one is the ussr which still exists one is china and one is the usa and they all have access to these apocalypse rituals from their um various mage um organizations and yeah so anyway there's, there's a few it, it, it's it's a bit of a odd um 
history. It's pretty short though, so I encourage people to go read it if they're interested to see, <laughs> see what it's about. Uh, but yeah, the fundamental basis is that the the various races and monsters and so up, so forth have always been around. Um, but one of the changes that does occur actually is that. Uh, in 2022, there is the catastrophic transmutative arcane contagion, which is, it's a typical, um, contaminant, I suppose it's in the atmosphere that causes sapient races to either go mad or mutate or turn into ergot, which, uh, um, yeah, awful mutated cannibalist um, mm -hmm. humanoids, uh, and and as a result of the sea tac uh, contamination that spreads throughout the whole world very quickly, cannot be contained um, because of this magical contaminant. What ends up happening is that the cities become a lot of the smaller cities are abandoned and towns and things they're gone, and the major cities become these kind of isolated strongholds where civilization continues in the usual way um so we end up with a we end up with a rpg world where you have kind of your traditional cyberpunk mixed with fantasy cities but outside of that there are these it's not exactly wastelands but there are these areas that are much more dangerous to travel in because they are you know prone to being filled with various monsters which are no longer being controlled because people can't go out there very easily because of the high level of the virus that's outside of the cities. Um, so you sort of get this cross between, yeah, sort of cyberpunkish cities, but outside of the cities you have these outlands which are sort of Mad Max style. Not exactly, you know, it's a bit of a cross, but there's sort of these Mad Max style wastelands and then you get to you know three thousand kilometers away is you know the next mega city um yeah so hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of where it's headed yeah i can see i can um i can kind of see where that i can kind of see where that sort of thing is going now obviously since you're still building off of um off of the fifth edition frame framework um if somebody was jumping into this with the framework of um, low fantasy ga low fantasy gaming, putting aside the fact that you're dealing with a different subject matter and going for cyberpunk instead of um, instead of instead of low fantasy slash swords and sorcery, yep, yep, um, yep. What sort of what sort of things would they potentially have to unlearn as far as assumptions go? Uh, if they're coming from Low fantasy gaming or fifth edition. The main, the number one thing would probably be that the characters in this game are much more. I wouldn't. Don't know if I would say that they are much more fragile, but this game is much more dangerous than both low fantasy gaming and and certainly way more dangerous than fifth edition. So in this game, your hit points are. They, they will start at about 10 to 20, something in that range, and then you get one extra hit, hit, hit point per level unless you get cyberware, which might increase it by 4 or 5 or 7 or something like that. But basically the hit point range is between about 10 and 30. Um, your armor range is generally about from 3 to... And this is damage reduction, I should say, 3 to 5 or 6, maybe if you get a lot of cyberware in there. But, um, but And the weapons do... A, Two-handed sword, if you use a katana or whatever, some kind of sword two-handed, for example, you do 2d8 plus your strength modifier. Mm -hmm. And a gun will do, a heavy gun will do 2d8 plus your perception modifier. If you start using burst fire or whatever, you add another die, so you do 3d8, for example. So the only reason I'm mentioning all that is that a, a combat can very quickly reduce you from 20 hit points to zero hit points. And that's very different to... It's very different to low fantasy gaming, which is built as, designed as, and that's an attrition-based dungeon crawler, right? You start out really strong, and as you progress through the adventure, you use up your resources and hit points go down. They go up and down as you use short rests and so on. But you sort of go up and down use up, and use up your class abilities, and you get whittled down 
and by the end of it, you know, you, you hopefully make it to the end. This game is not like that. This 2090, Low Life 2090 is, I, I don't know, I call it an anti-attrition combat where it's just all out everything, every combat, because <laughs> if you don't, you could easily die, especially if you're outnumbered. Um, so if you've got those plus abilities, you use them. Um, so the things to unlearn would be that this is not like a dungeon crawler where you expect to go into, you know, numerous fights over time and get whittled down. It's not like that. It's, you would expect, well, we expect it to be a play played in a way that the combats are, there will still be combat, I have no doubt, and the adventures that will be written for it, there will definitely be combats in it, but they will tend to be, um, you know, there will be less combats and they will be much more um, fear, they will be much more dangerous combat. Every combat will be more dangerous. I mean, I can't say that every combat will be dangerous. If it's just one guy and you've got your whole crew of four or five, you'll probably destroy that one guy pretty quickly. But in any combat where there's an equal number of combatants, and particularly if anyone's got a submachine gun or anything capable of burst fire, or well, God help you, a grenade, um, you know, things get really super dangerous. Um, Pretty quickly so you would want to approach this game in a more careful manner when coming to combat in terms of progression yep yeah, so the progression is more limited you still get it's so it is based on the lfg engine you still get a new class ability every level and you get a new use of an ability every level so you do get you definitely get stronger as you progress but it is a limited increase because firstly because hit points don't in, increase all that much and secondly, because the um, the your in this game, there's a defense. There is a defense stat, which is like your armor class. But so it doesn't. If you're a combat class, it in increases a fair bit, but not a great deal. If you're not a combat class, it doesn't really increase very much. So what that means is that you know the basic security guard or gang art, which are sort of your lower end threats. They are still dangerous to everybody as you, even at eighth level or ninth level, if there are, you know, if you've got eight security guards and a crew of three or four and those guards have got submachine guns, that's dangerous even for an eighth level party. So, um, yeah, you would want to unlearn the idea that, you know, first level orcs, you can, they're dangerous, but by the time you're 10th level, they're not a threat. That's not going to be the case in this game. It, depending on how they're equipped, they could still be, still very much be a threat and you might want to yeah you'd want to take steps to um if you're going to start that combat you want to start it you know on your terms and finish it as quickly as you can oh uh, what else have we got the other things so unique features are much the same as like any fantasy gaming the attributes are very similar it's still a roll under attribute game um and a roll high for attacks and damage so same as low fantasy gaming if you're coming from 5e you would have to get used to the idea of rolling under for attribute checks, um, which some people really don't like, but other people come around to it or, and some people love it. I personally love it, <laughs> of course, which is why I put it in there. But it really brings your attributes to the front, to front and center, right? I mean, <clears throat> if, so that's the design reason behind it is that if, when you have this roll under attribute game, your attributes are really important. So if you've got strength 14, it's, it's very different to having someone with strength eight, which in a 5e game is just a plus one or a minus one modifier, right? So it's mostly the d20 and what happens there. But if you've got 14 strength and you're trying to roll under that versus strength eight and trying to roll under that, it's it's a very different game in um, in low fantasy gaming or uh, low life 2090. Uh, so what else would be different? Let me see. Um, diminishing luck is the same so as you go through the job or the adventure or mission, every time you succeed on a luck save or a luck check, uh, your luck goes down. So there is this sort of inherent uh, increasing, increasing danger as you go along if you have to make many luck rolls. Um, let's see, what else have we got? Oh, Perilous Magic. So that actually, the magic is not... Too different from low fantasy gaming but it's very different to 5e so anytime you cast a spell in 2090 you have to make a will check if you make the will check if you get a great success you get a bonus effect on your spell an ordinary success just works 
a fail or a terrible failure on your check makes uh, causes you to roll in the dark what's called the dark flux table. And the dark flux table is basically it's very similar to the low fantasy gaming dark and dangerous magic table where all sorts of crap, all sorts of stuff can happen, but it's all bad. <laughs> so that's one. Actually, that's one thing for the LFG guys. In LFG, some of the effects on the dark and dangerous magic table were not bad. They were all right. They were good. Mm -hmm. But that is not the case here. Dark Flux, everything is bad, although some of it is just cosmetic stuff like like foul beard. If you roll a one on the D100, you grow a beard of short rubbery tentacles that you can't control. They shrivel, they shrivel up and drop off after 1D6 days. So not that bad. It's just a cosmetic thing. Um, but then at the other end of the scale, you've got – there's quite a number of entries where – um, an abomination breaks through the veil and attacks you or a spell burst where a random instead of the spell you want you get a random spell affecting the target which could be you roll on another table all sorts of stuff can happen yeah. or um or you might grow a tentacle or you know whatever and some of the effects are temporary like a number of hours or some are a number of months and some are permanent if you roll you know 99 or 100 on the table you can get a permanent um I don't know, <clears throat> you speak in a weird chittering or whatever it is. Um, there's all sorts of things that can go on. But basically, Dark Flux is generally bad news. So magic is much more dangerous than 5e, and it, it is even more dangerous than <laughs> my fantasy gaming magic. Uh, yeah, but anyways, it's, but it's fun. It's a, it's, a, it's a fun magic system to use because you, you can't be sure what will, what will happen with it. And that's what makes it, I think... Uh, it gives it a little bit more, it's a bit more special, you know, it, magic is not fire and forget and automatically works. It's not like that. It can definitely backfire um, and cause all sorts of trouble, but not just for, not just for the, the mage who is casting the spell, or if you've got a magic item, because of course, you know, magic items exist in this game and you might be a brawler or a gun hand or whatever, and you've got hold of a magic item and you're using it, you know, you make these same checks. So if you, if that stuff's up, you know, it can affect not not only you, whoever it is who's trying to use the magic, but the people around you. So because if, if you conjure some demon from the void, well, you know, whoever's around has to deal with it, not just not just the guy who is casting the spell. So yep. yeah. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, let me get back to your main question. So magic is different. They would have to get used to that. Let me see. Oh, the other thing I suppose is that um, so when you take short rests, or long rest in this game, mm -hmm. which is actually similar to low fantasy gaming, but is very different to 5e, is that recovery is not automatic. So when you have a short rest, you make two will checks. And if you succeed on those checks, you can get, you can restore some used resource. For example, a class ability or a reroll die or um, a point of uh, a tribute loss. So if you've been taking combat drugs or something and you've suffered some kind of a tribute loss, or you've suffered it some other way. Mm -hmm. If you take a short rest, you if you make if you succeed on your wheel checks, you can get some things back, and you choose what to get back, right? If you make your wheel check, but if you fail your wheel check, you get nothing back. Um, so yeah, unlike fifth edition, when you use your abilities, you cannot be certain that you'll get them back later. I mean, there's a good chance you will because if you got a reasonable wheel score there's a pretty good chance you'll get something back. Or if you take a long rest, you can get more checks to try and get them back again. But um, yeah, that's, so that is also something to adjust to. You shouldn't go into this game thinking you can spam your abilities just because you've got, you know, your mission is you've got a week before the deadline, so you've got seven days. So, oh, well, I'll just spam my abilities. It's not necessarily a good plan to do that because you may not get them back if you, if you for example, Nova some encounter and then, um, anyways. It's just something to take into account that you may not necessarily get your abilities back when you want them. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, networking. So this game has a specific, has a much stronger networking or contacts aspect to it compared to a fantasy game. Um, so in most, at least the ones that I've tended to run and have read, you've got your rumor, you know, rumor hunting, Sort of style of um, use of contacts that you might have in the fantasy world, but in this kind of game, prior to 
starting your, you know, assault on the job, whatever it is, or prior to, you know, really taking steps to, to fulfill whatever the mission is, generally speaking in this game, there will be a, a networking style, um, a legwork kind of phase where you, you know, make inquiries with different people you might know or contacts that they've got or whatever, trying to find out more information you know, about, oh, so what exactly is this research facility we're going into? Or, you know, who exactly is this person that, you know, we're supposed to extract from, you know, wherever it is. Um, so there's there's a particular part of this game which is not really present in a fantasy game. So you would, yeah, that's something else to um, to grapple with. I guess it's not unlearning, is it? It's not, you're not unlearning anything. But anyway, there's just this other aspect to the to yeah. the game they're probably the main things just looking i'm just sort of looking at page five of the draft trying to think about the core features but they're probably the main changes that you'd have to get used to and i'd imagine that one of the one of the um main things that that somebody would have to get used to is the notion that if they're picking mage they don't automatically get some sort of spell list they've got they've um they've got to go they've got to go out and They've got a number of spe- a number of spell slots that they can that they can use, but yep. it's not like they're going to be starting out with a host with a host of spells al- already. No, definitely not. So actually, that is a good point. That the magic is much more restricted. So magic magic is still powerful. In fact, it's, you know it's the most powerful force in the game. Right? It's magic. It can do things that nothing else can do. Um, but that's right. The mage only starts out with the number of spells equal to his or her intelligence modifier. Or maybe one plus, anyway, a very small number, you know, two or three probably spells. And then as they <clears throat> go up levels, they get one more spell each level. And not only is it only one spell, but they also have to pay for it. <laughs> it's, and it's in the order of 30000 or $40,000, right? It's, but it costs a lot to get your next spell. And that's for... That is a game balance thing. It, you know, we want the casters to have to spend their money the same way that the brawlers and the gun hands and the infiltrators and the influencers, all the other classes who are spending their money on cyberware um, or vehicles or whatever. And, and of course, a magic character can buy vehicles. But generally speaking, they won't be buying cyberware because there's kind of a, you know, there's a, um, for game balance reasons, there is a, um, you know, they don't, they don't work well together cyberware and magic but um so anyway we need an outlet we we needed something for the magic classes and there's only two of them one is the mage and one is the exarch um we needed something for them to be spending their money on besides vehicles and guns and so on so their their spells or their imbuement rituals if you're an exarch because they imbue themselves with magical tattoos which enhance their they're like magical monks, right? The Exarch is like a magical monk. In order to get their powers, they need to spend, you know, large amounts of money to get these rituals, the ritual components, you know, the reagents and things that they need to to perform the ritual. And the sorcerers and the wizards and the witches and the warlocks, all those sort of general spellcasters need to spend lots of money on the the spells, whether it's formula or, I don't know, some kind of insight. Yeah, I guess it's got to be some kind of formula. But anyway, in order to get their spells, they need to spend the money too. So everybody everybody wants money because in order to increase your character's um, abilities, you need that cash to 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 spend. Oh, all right. That 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 definitely makes sense. Um, now one of the th- one of the things that. I noticed when it came to when it came to the uh, character setup is it se- it seems to be kind of a in between mo- in between motif of some of the character archetypes you have with D and D slash low fantasy gaming and some of the bi- some of the build types that are um, unofficial mascots for Shadowrun because Shadowrun likes to claim that it's a classless game even though um. Yeah, yeah, Pract- yeah. It's one of those ca- it's one of those cases where, technically speaking, it's a classless game, but practically speaking, not so much. Yeah, yeah. The archetypes are really, uh, I mean, yeah. The example archetypes are as, yeah, they're like classes, aren't they? I mean, they 
they technically the gate. That's right. It, it's they don't have classes, but archetypes are pretty pretty similar. So yes. we've got mm -hmm. yeah, we've gone with classes. You know, same as Low Fantasy Gaming that has classes. <clears throat> Fifth edition has classes. We've got classes, mm -hmm. and we've got Brawler. Uh, let me see. Let me just quickly bring up the list. So brawlers are your melee experts, effectively. The other thing I should say before we on classes is that everybody, all of these classes, same as low fantasy gaming, <clears throat> all of the classes are good at combat. There's no one who's bad at combat. There are some classes that are, or I should say, there is no class that if you choose, you are stuffed in combat, right? There's, they all have combat-related abilities. It's just a matter of whether you choose those abilities. So... The influencer, for example, who is like the negotiator or the face style, you know, face man, if you choose that class, you are probably, you know, there are more options for um, <clears throat> non-combat related uh, abilities, but, but they all have some kind of combat related abilities. And frankly, anybody in this game with a submachine gun <laughs> is dangerous, right? And all of the classes, the minimum sort of weapons that you can be proficient with, the mage, for example, or the hacker, they both get <clears throat> pistols, submachine guns, and at least one melee, and that's blades, blunt, or unarmed. So any any of these guys can pick up a submachine gun, and as soon as, you got, as you've got a weapon like that or a heavy pistol, you know, you they're very they're dangerous. These are dangerous guys. So the, the brawler is the is the melee expert. He's you know. If you if you want to play a melee guy, you play the brawler. But having said that, you know he can use pistols, submachine guns, shotguns, grenades, and then melee weapons and projectiles. So he can use all sorts of. So they can. The point I'm trying to make is they can all use firearms, right? Because this is a cyberpunk game, so mm -hmm. we want everyone be, to be able to use the the guns because it's part of the fun. Yeah. The Entec is the. <clears throat> he's our. He's like the mad scientist, really. He's he. Part tech genius, part mad engineer. He is the guy who, if you want to use the technology, which is a little bit above everybody else, so he's, you can choose abilities which give you things that are really not, they're more like a proper sci-fi, you know, in the further future. He's got like a, he can do EM, an EMP pulse, although there are EMP grenades and stuff in the game, but he, he's got his own little EMP pulse. He's got a, a rocket launcher in his cyber arm. He's got um, like a shield, like kind of a force field. Anyway, he's like your mad scientist type, mm -hmm. but he's also dangerous because when he, when you want to make, he's a little bit like the mage. When you want to use one of your abilities, um, you have to make a check. And if the check doesn't work, you end up rolling on, one of these tables, it's either the cyber glitch table, the electronics glitch table, or the toxin trauma table. They're all bad tables. You don't want to roll on those tables. But, you know, his technology, it's awesome, it's advanced, but it's also unreliable. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there is a risk. There's a risk that attaches to him. So he's kind of like he's kind of like the mage, but a, but a high technology guy. Anyway, that's what he does. Exarch is your, he's the um, magical monk style guy. Um, or like he's sort of like a fighter mage from second edition AD and D, but he doesn't cast spells. He instead imbues his body with these magical tattoos. It gives him all sorts of abilities. So he's good against. <clears throat> he works well against magical threats as well as non-magical threats. So if you have to fight a demon or you have to fight a abomination or a vampire or whatever, the exarch is very good at that. But he's not as, and he's also good at cutting up. You know security guards and gangers and whatever but he's not as good he's sort of he's a little bit jack of all trades in terms of those two areas so he will not shoot as well as the gun hand and he is not as good a brawler in in melee as the pure brawler but he his benefit is that he can also handle the magical threats um <clears throat> gun hand is our shooter you know he's the prime shooter he's or she she's got all sorts of shooting abilities, that's what she does. If you want to be the best shooter in the game, you play the gun hand. Um, hacker is your hacker guy, as the name might suggest. Uh, so the way hacking works in this game, it's a class, it's class based, class mm -hmm. ability based. We've tried to simplify it by making it into a class based thing. So only the hacker can hack, except there are two exceptions. <clears throat> the um, 
the infiltrator, who's the next class, he uh, is like, you know, he's your covert operator guy, sneaky, sneaky. He's like the thief. He's like the, um, yeah, he's, he's like a, you know, technological thief. Uh, but he comes with, you can choose, I should say, out of his list of abilities, there's door hacking and camera hacking, which piggybacks off the hacker class. So you go back to the hacker class to see how that works. But so he's got a little bit of hacking to l let him get into places. Um, and the Vex, which is our, um, you know, expert driver, he's like the wheel man of the group. The Vex gets hijack. He gets two hacks, which is one is hijacking drones. He can hijack drones and he can hijack vehicles because he's the vehicle guy, right? So yeah. he gets a little bit of hacking as well. But <clears throat> other than that, and, and I should say the other classes can all get can all get each other's abilities, but only by using the unique features at third level, sixth level, and ninth level. So at those levels, and maybe first level if the GM wants to be really generous, but um, or has experienced players and they want to have more characters with greater sort of um, depth. At, at those levels, when you get your unique features, you can take what's called a cross class ability and there's one for each class which lets you sort of cherry pick some bit abilities from each if you if you're a brawler for example and you want to do a bit of hacking you can take the hacker cross class at third and choose you know and take a little bit of hacking and add it to your character but i should say that it, it, it's not just full-on cherry picking some some abilities are specific to the class and you cannot get it you cannot get those abilities without choosing that class. There's a bit of niche protection, if you like. Um, you can't just, yeah, anyway, but yeah, if you know what I mean. There, so there is there is this sort of multi-classing that can go on to a limited degree, but you know, if you want to be the hacker, choose the hacker class. Yeah. If you want to be the fighter, choose the brawler or the gun hand or the exarch. Um, to, be quite, yeah. to be quite honest, and I know this might sound controversial to some traditionalists, um, Going all the going all the way back to D, going all the way back to D and D, that's a system that's never really felt a hundred percent comfortable with multiclassing. Um, yeah, yeah, it's one of those things where you can certainly do it, but you know how you know how some you know how in some um, in some cases with video games, if you do a certain exploit, it technically works, but it feels like you're doing something that you're not supposed to. <laughs> yeah. That's the yeah, way absolutely. I always feel with um with multiclassing. I feel like the game that the game is not is not built or is not built around the concept. So whenever somebody tries to multiclass, you either end up with one of two extremes: either it's a multiclass that's a worst of both worlds, <laughs> or it's completely fucking broken. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if that's why I played Fighter Majors all the time in second edition. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> played Gish. It was really strong. It was really strong. Yeah. Well, and, well it didn't it yeah. didn't help that if that um <laughs> that up and that up until two thousand eight, if you wanted to play Fighter um and do interesting things, you'd have to yes. multi class. True. Because so true. because Fighter has been the pee the dog of, of D D for 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 about thirty years. It's so true. They were the workhorse that, yeah, didn't get a lot of options. They, they weren't the workhorse, but they started that unfortunate stereotype of standard fighters, which has anno which has annoyed me ever since I started in this hobby. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, look, so, so we have not going. We have, like low fantasy gaming, we have not included a full blown multi class option, and partly for that reason, because normally. It will tend to be OP if if you allow it. It will tend to be really strong. Um, so what we've so the unique features, you know, they let you choose two abilities from the class, which is two out of like twelve, um, and you can't you can't choose basically you can't choose their best abilities or their niche their their real their core defining abilities. You cannot choose those. So you can get a bit of if you're a mage and you want some better shooting, you can take the gun hand cross class feature mm. and it will give you you know some bits and pieces but it won't make you anything like a gun hand but it will make you better at shooting um yeah so then so infiltrator yeah influencer who is the face man has all sorts of abilities to do I, actually you know what the influencer is like the bard in 5e 
or in low fantasy gaming. Kind of a bard. They pull the party together. They've got abilities that inspire the others. But also they are... They're also... Um, their abilities are much more geared towards... Um, actually, they're jack of all trades. They've got a pretty decent range of things. But, yeah, inspiring allies. They've got a lie detector thing. They can... Oh, facial reconfiguration. They can change their cheeks and their face to look different. So they've got... If you choose the influencer, you come and you choose that ability of facial reconfiguration, you basically get, you know, a cybernetic... Um, your face has been cybernetically upgraded so that it can change. Um, and then they've got other bits and pieces. But So they're sort of the bard or... Um, yeah, they're the face man of the group. Mage, so that's standard... Basically standard mage. So that, there's no breakdown like for warlocks or witches or um, sorcerers or wizards it's just mage and you can fluff it however you like really but the only thing that you can't fluff is that as i was as i mentioned before is that in order to get the spells you have to spend the money so you're gonna have so everyone just kind of has to deal with that i suppose but it's a yeah i know that and oh well actually it's not entirely true because there is a, a unique feature where you can just basically spontaneously learn some spells but outside of that and of course for npcs these rules don't necessarily apply the gm can do whatever they want but for the purposes of players, for for gameplay reasons, we want them to spend the money to get their spells because otherwise you get this weird situation where mages have all this money and they don't know what to do with it, so they spend it all on insane vehicles <laughs> and uh, they get crazy powerful when the poor Vex, who also has to spend money on drones and um, cyberware, falls behind. So anyway... There's the mage, and then, yep, sorry, the vex is the last guy. So we've got nine mm -hmm. classes in there. And they cover the usual, I think they cover the usual cyberpunk slash Shadowrun slash Star Wars style of Which, characters, you know. You know, given yeah. given the um, given the re given the recent release of Cyberpunk Red and 2077. Mm. Um, yeah. And I, I, I did this, I did this a while back with a pre, with a, um, with Gene, with the guy behind Gene Funk, I figured I may, I figured I may as well um, double dip here. Yeah. Um, I'm going. I'm going to go through the. I'm going to go through the roles in in Cyberpunk, and I'd like. I'd like you to tell me which um, which of these would have it, or what the what their um equivalent might be. In low life 2090, because I have because okay, okay, yep, yep. If, if there is one, there might not be one. <laughs> well, if there, go for it, go for it. That's certain. That is certainly a poss That's certainly a possibility. Yep. Um, yep. I, I played 2020. I played Cyberpunk 2020. You know, many years ago, and it was awesome fun. But I remember there was some strange. What I thought were some strange classes in there. Um, yeah. But anyways, yeah, go for it. And I'm I'm for. I'm perfectly aware that some of these are going to be um, stretching more than others simply due to the nature of the beast when it comes to conversion. Um, part of the reason I ask this kind of thing is with how popular the 5e rule set is, and it's one of those cases where I could see the logical chain where somebody gets into Cyberpunk through 2077 and then um, and then so, and then they hear about this whole role playing thing and think, oh, I want I want to try that out, and then they come across something like Low Life 2090 and you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. All sure. right. So I'll start off at the top with Rocker Boys. That would probably be our influencer, I would say. It's the guy who from what I remember of Rocker Boys, it's they they are um you know, they're musicians and sort of celebrities that influence their followers. Mm-hmm. Um, and the influ influencer in 2090 is probably the closest you would get to that. So the influencer abilities include, um, calling up backup, for example, you can get some guys to come and help you in the current mission and they're good. Um, you can take abilities that give you advantage on your leadership skill or your persuasion skill or your deception skill. Um, but there is no, I must confess, that, and I don't know if Rocker Boy has this ability, but there is nothing that is like a, a musical talent 
skill I'm per- in the I'm game. I'm perfectly fine. Other than that, um, yeah. To be quite to be quite honest with both with bards, um, I find that a lot of people get way too hung up on. And, and I'm saying this on both the player and the designer end of things. People get <laughs> yeah. too hung up on the music part of bards. Yep, yep, yep. When... Oh, I think so too. I prefer my bard, and you can see it in the low fantasy gaming. It, there is no music. There is no singing. Unless you want there to be. There can be, but the core class doesn't mention anything about it. It's just about being an awesome leader and, you know, inspiring personality, magnetic, you know, charismatic guy. Or, or character and that's what it's about not and music can be part of it or being an awesome singer can be part of it but it's not it's not required it's certainly not required there's no magical music or anything somebody um, somebody once asked me what my um what my favorite interpretation of a bard in um video games is and uh, oh yeah i had i had said i had said varic tethris from dragon age 2 and inquisition oh yeah Okay, okay. Which might sound a bit odd because he's a rogue, not a bard, but for me, a bard should be the living avatar of I know a guy. <laughs> yeah. Well connected, lots of influence, you know, moves in many spheres. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep. I like it. And probably like has it. a long list of people who he's pissed off or screwed over. Oh, or absolutely. Both. As many as many enemies as they've got friends, right? Mm-hmm. But that's how it goes. But an enemy today is next week's friend, you know, depending on the circumstances. So, yeah. So yeah. next is Solos. Solo is our brawler or gun hand. They're their fighters, right? That's what I recall. Mm-hmm. Is They're the mercenary um, shooters. So, yeah, brawler or gun hand or Exarch, maybe, you know, he's also a fighter. Yeah. Um, net runners. That's our hacker. I, fig- I figured that one. I figured that would be. Um, <laughs> that one's pretty straightforward. Pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, um, yeah. Techies. Techies are our end techs. So I'm not sure how far the tech goes in Cyberpunk 2020 or in. I do have Cyberpunk read. I don't. I and I, re- I read parts of it. I just don't remember how far their technology goes. I think. But anyway, it's that's a similar thing. You know, they create stuff, and it's high tech. You know, where it's not. Yeah, that so that's what that would be the analog. Yeah, and I'm skipping med tech because I'm because it's probably going to have the same answer. That we don't really have an equivalent of the med tech actually. We got so everybody can use first aid kits. Everyone can use spray on skin. We've got a combat drug called Brox, which anybody can administer. Um, there is no med tech. If you want to be good at healing, you just have to pick up the first aid skill. And buy yourself a first aid kit, and you'll be pretty good at it. Yep. Yeah. Um, yes, actually, that's right. There is no he- there is there's no dedicated healing in this game. There's no like cleric equivalent. Yeah. Um. Or or med tech. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Media. Media. I don't think we've got that. I mean, the, again, the influencer is probably the closest, and you would just choose abilities that affect your that give you advantage on those skills that. Are going to be most relevant to influencing an audience yeah um cops although it was re it was retitled as lawman in um cyberpunk red all right mm, we don't have that either because in i mean the clo- i remember the cop from 2020 and i can't remember what he's like in cyberpunk red but i seem to recall you know they're still good shooters they can call on their organization for certain resources relating to law enforcement and they might have certain privileges, you know, um, because of their status. But the equivalent of that is just going to be our brawler Exarch or gun hand, really. It's still a fighter, you know, fighter type class. Um, but you could, um, you would want contacts. If you had contacts in this game as part of your networking, um, under your networking, if you had contacts that are related to the police, well, you would have something like, yeah, a lawman. Yeah. Um, now, the next is corporate, but I'm skipping that over simply because the class design in um, Low Life and the class design for something like Cyberpunk, I, something like corporate would be way too broad. Yeah, I don't compared, think... Compared to I think we just don't have that. Yeah, and also our guys... So the idea... The basic idea with the Low Life is that you're all... 
no one chooses to get into this. You're, you're all criminals and no one choose to, chooses this. Almost no one chooses this life. Mm-hmm. You've ended up there by some kind of bad fortune or bad choices. And we've got a table actually that you roll on. It's called the turning point table. The turning point when you go from being a normal civilian to a low life. And once you cross that boundary, then you know, you're stuffed. There's no going back. And you're in this other world now, this criminal world. And you all start at the bottom of the rung, <laughs> right? Everyone's poor with a little bit of cyberware or whatever. And then at first level, and you see where you go. So we don't have the equivalent of a corporate who, I don't exactly remember what they do, but I think they work for the corps, of, obviously from the name. But um, you can't, you know, there's nothing like that where you can draw the corporation for help. Um, there is there isn't really an equivalent. The, uh, I feel like the, um, a character like a corp is 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 one that's going to lean more towards white collar crime. And I don't I yeah. don't think that's exactly what you're shoot what you're shooting for. It's one of those things that no, you can no. shoot for, but it, it's not it's no, it's not the default. No. Yeah. Um. Fixer. Hmm, Fixer is really an NPC in our game. I mean, the influencer would again be the closest to a Fixer because, for example, the influencer starts with five contacts instead of three in our game. And when you roll on the contacts table, when you create your character, um, when you roll for your contacts for the influencer, he or she has really good, has really strong contacts like gang boss, Mm-hmm. Fixer. Fixer is one of their contacts. Um, city executive, um, po- a peacekeeper detective, or a crime boss. So these are high-level, powerful contacts compared to, say, you know, a brawler whose contacts list includes a, str- a street doc and a gym boss and a you know corp security guy. So the influencer is probably the closest to the fixer, but technically that's the NPC. I mean, a- an influencer might retire at the end of the game as a fixer you know what i mean yeah that um, might be an end, an end game for them the last one is nomads nomads is our vex so nomads the driver right mm-hmm. expert the wheel man that's our vex yeah and with that kind, with that kind of thing in mind that do, that um that does bring me to one question that, that i wanted to ask because a lot of times when um when cy- when cyberware is used, mm-hmm. um, there's there tends to be some sort of soft cap. Um, yep, Cyberpunk yep. had it. Um, one of the more in, one of the more infamous examples and one of the more scub examples in some cases for me is the whole essence thing with um, Shadowrun, yep. yep, where yep. putting more cyberware or bioware is going to reduce your essence, which you go too far on that, you end, and you end up going into full cyber zombie, which Unfortunately for unfortunately for me meant that I couldn't tell somebody that they weren't a full cyborg like the major as much as they wanted to be one. Yep, yep. But when it comes to cyberware for low life is that is that something that can happen or what's the catch when it comes to putting too much cyberware on a PC? Nope, we do not have anything like that. There is no cap. So the there's no cap in theory, <laughs> but in practice, the cap is how much money and time the characters have and the supply rules. So we have a rule. So we have a pretty defined downtime cycle. It's called downtime cycle. That's what we called it. But it's, it's reminiscent of if you're familiar with Blades in the Dark, where mm-hmm. there's a certain steps that you move through in downtime um we've sort of got a variation of that um where let me see i'll just quickly bring it up so there's downtime expenses there's a heat adjustment there's a recovery period if you're injured or mad you know you've got madness or addiction or whatever there's an update your network advancement and then there's three activities at the bottom so those three activities include buying gear or research or repairs on broken things or whatever training and reputation <clears throat> if so the practical cap on cyberware in this game is you know it costs money so you're only going to get so much money at the end of a job 
Um, and yeah, and we've, we've put some guidelines in there actually. And when we produce some adventures shortly, they'll be using these guidelines, but basically an easy job is about 15,000 per PC is the pay 15 grand per PC. A standard job is about 30 K and a really dangerous, like high, high risk mission might be 70 K or more. And then if you look at the cyberware prices, um, or just the prices of different things, uh, it can give you some examples. So a, a, if you look at cars, for example, the, um, the little Kia Wicket is 12 grand, but a Ford Urban, which is your, your family car sedan is 35 grand. And if you go to, or if you want, I don't know, if you want the, um, let's have a look, the four wheel drive is 55 grand. The Maserati Blaze, which is your sports car is 300 grand. But if you go to your uh, cyberware section, then what we've tried to do is put a good range of stuff in there, but the really powerful stuff is quite expensive. So what ends up being the cap on your cyberware is the cost. So if you want a core reinforcement, which is like, you know, your skull and spine and your rib cage and all that are, are reinforced with polymer or chromium alloy, polymer costs 38,000. So you might have to do two runs or you might get away. You might be able to afford that after one run. If you pick up some extra loot, you know, throughout the adventure, but the chromium alloy one, which, which is the higher level, that's 75,000. So you'd have to do at least one, you know, very risky run to get that. Um, but on the, on the other hand, there's cheaper stuff like a grapple whip that pops out of your palm is 14,000. Mm -hmm. Um, an oxygen filter bank is 30,000 stem cell drive is anything from 15,000 to 80,000 your um trauma sleeve which is like a you know armor that go, that is under your skin or whatever that's 50,000 or 120,000 strength graphs are 25 grand up to 98 grand um what else what's the what's another important one like the motion surge which is your you know all, all these games have a an ability a cyberware that makes you move quicker in in with respect to danger the lowest level of that chem stim is 60 grand and the highest level the mycena blitzware is 210 grand so the practical cap is the money it's going to cost a lot if you want to load your pc up with cyberware you're going to have to do a lot of runs a lot of missions a lot of um uh jobs you know to to earn that money in order to buy that that cyberware or you know get it as part of payment for your job if you do a particular job you know maybe you get offered you know the niobium accelerators which are normally worth 130 grand but if you do this job we'll put a, you know we'll put some in you um so we don't have a separate yet there's no like the cyberpunk cyber psychosis there's not there's nothing like that and there's no um shutter on style essence statistic we don't have it would it be yep. fair to say that the control is the fact that having more and more cyberware is going to make you more vulnerable to getting screwed over by EMPs? Absolutely. So that that's right. There is, there's always a catch. <laughs> and the catch for a guy with lots and lots of cyberware is going to be partly EMP, which is supposed to be very rare, right? Incredibly rare in this game. It shouldn't be, it, we don't, well, I don't know. In the default setting, it's not expected that you would see a lot of that, but you will see it from time to time. Yep, and a guy, uh, a guy with lots of cyberware who is subject to an EMP grenade or the EMP rifle—I forget what it's called off the top of my head—you um, know, or or some other EMP style effect. Um, yeah, that's going to screw them up big time if they get hit by that. Um, and there's also <clears throat> just generally, we've got a, what's called the cyber glitch table. So we've got a whole series of trauma tables which are like persistent injuries in low fantasy gaming we have the injuries and setbacks table which are you know longer term injuries that hang around for a while you know for a number of weeks or a number of months if you break your arm or fractured ribs or whatever um we have that we, we still have the injuries and setbacks table in this game but we also have a separate trauma table we have a blunt trauma blade trauma blast trauma for explosions um toxin trauma for chemicals and drugs and whatever. And we've also got a vehicle trauma, which is to do with vehicles. They have their own special rules, but 
Um, so basically, if um, some of those trauma tables cause damage to your cyberware, and if you suffer damage to your cyberware, you roll on this cyber glitch table, and bad stuff can happen <laughs> on there. So yeah, there's, there's you know there's on the whole having cyberware is awesome and it's going to make your character much more powerful, but there is a drawback. So yeah, the more the, the more cyberware you've got, the more chance that if you um, suffer some kind of trauma, that uh, mm -hmm. one of those things might end up sort of biting you in the ass later. But yeah, um, we haven't seen anyone go too cyber crazy in our playtest, but I mean, you know, we haven't been playtesting it for all that long, you know, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> but I suppose what it does mean is that the GM has a lot of, has a lot more options. The GM can pack the cyberware into an NPC and there's no restriction. Not really. If that NPC is the, you know, the head killer from some mega corporation and they've packed all this, they've turned him into a robot, a Robocop style character. Well, yep, he's going to be dangerous. <laughs> I'm out. Hope you've got your EMP grenade <laughs> to, um, to take care of him. Yeah, and, that, and if, you, if you don't, well, hope you brought a lot more bullets. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, you know, no, no character is, no humanoid character is, is going to be, um, you know, super strong in this game. I mean, well, we do have rules for boss monsters, actually, which makes them significantly stronger than a PC. Um, but that's intentional. That's supposed to be a, a boss. You know, it, they break the rules. They're supposed to be stronger. They're supposed to be able to threaten the party by themselves. And we also introduced a little mini category called heavies in this one as well. So we didn't have heavies in low fantasy gaming, but we've got them here just because we want the lieutenants to be a bit stronger than normal because most, to be frank, most gangers and security guards, little sort of ordinary guys, they will tend to go down in one or two shots or one or two blows from your sword or, you know, sledgehammer or chainsaw or whatever it is. Whatever your weapon of destruction is, it will take out most things in one or two hits, which means combat is very quick. Um, but so we've put these heavies and bosses in there to, um, yeah. they're a bit more difficult to get rid of. And in addition to that, of course, we've got all the monsters. So if you end up traveling into the wastelands or the outlands beyond Mendoza City, then there's all sorts of stuff out there forest trolls. Um, <laughs> You've got wyverns, we've got dragons, we've got all the, we've got mantle worms, which are like your giant dune star worm <laughs> coming out of the earth to eat your vehicle. We've got griffins, we've got all sorts of stuff, um, which are, are really, you know, they're much tougher than a person. So, you know, you've got to look out for them as well. Oh, yeah. Now, you've got, now you've, um, now, First off, I do want to congratulate you for successfully kickstarting um, Low Life 2090. I realize that 2020 has been a turbulent year, but what would you be shooting for as far as a release window of the of the uh, product? Uh, so we will have this out at the latest in, at the end of April of 2021, and that's that's what we said in the Kickstarter is going to be. End of April 2021. We might mm -hmm. get the PDF out earlier than that. We we definitely could get the PDF out earlier than that, but I'm re reluctant to do that only because it. I don't know. We just want to make sure that the PDF looks exactly like the book. That the book looks exactly like the PDF. And sometimes what you get in print is not, despite all your best efforts, is not exactly. It doesn't look quite the same as what's in the PDF. So <clears throat> we'll see how we go with that. But well we're looking at end of April and we're well on track to that. At the moment the I forget what the first draft went to, but it's the current draft that I've got is two hundred and eighty four pages and we've basically put a cap on it at around three hundred pages. And at the moment I'm just doing the I mean I've made we've made some rules tweaks already and there'll there'll be an updated um, draft PDF coming out in January, just to have to let people have another look at that. And we'll, we've got a document that lists the changes that we've made and the reasons why we've made those changes based on feedback that we've received, as well as our own continuing to iterate based on the, our own playtesting. But 
we've got some really good feedback from some people and we've so we've made certain tweaks to try and make things clear up and we've we've changed a few things but anyway so that will come out in january it's with the updates um and at the moment most of the work on my end at least is doing all the random tables for we're doing day and night encounter tables for all the 20 districts so just going through all of the mendoza city districts and doing their encounter tables but <clears throat> That'll do, and that'll be another ten pages easy. So, it will get to around three hundred pages, I think, and we should have that. That should all be done January sometime, and then it's really just tweaking, you know, proper editing. We haven't edited it yet, I should say. Anyone who's listening, this has not been edited, <laughs> so it's been proofread. We've done our best, but we've got to do a proper editing sweep, sweep, which we will do multiple of, of course. Um, that takes a while. And that's the worst part of the job, frankly. But so we'll do that um, February, March, while we're still getting feedback. And then April, that's it. It'll be the cutoff. And it'll be earlier than that, actually, the cutoff. But yeah, in order to get the print out by end of April, um, yeah, we're looking at a couple of months before that. But yeah, so sorry, rambling on. But the uh, end, the final answer is April 2021. All right, I, and what are you shooting for as far as a page count? I think 300. I think it'll be 300 pages. You could easily do, we could easily do a book on the setting, right? Mendoza City. What we've put in this core book, which we did not do in low fantasy gaming. In low fantasy gaming, we just got to the end of the rules and went, that's it. This, here's the book. And I can't remember how many pages it was. It was 285 or something. This probably would have been similar to that, but we decided, oh, no, it might have been 250. But anyway, we decided in this one that we would put in, you know, a, a fair bit of setting. It's not, it's enough for a GM to go, okay, I want to run it in this setting. You know, here's Mendoza City. Here's something about the Outlands. Here's all the 20 districts. Here's the city map. We've got a lexicon, a few different other bits and pieces. Um, and in order to do that, it adds another 30 pages, right? So instead of 280 or whatever it is, it ends up being 300. So I think the page count will be, it'll be in the 300 mark. It might be a bit more, might be a bit less, but it'll be around there. All right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, with, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity. And thank God we, we didn't get fucked over by Australian internet this time. <laughs> It worked. It worked. It's probably my internet, not more than anyone else's. No, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate you, Amanda. You know, offering me this, uh, offering me this spot, and letting me have a uh, having a chat about about what we've got coming out. Mm -hmm. And of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!